Hello and welcome to the podcast, Speaking to Influence, Communication Secrets of the C-Suite. I'm Dr. Laura Socola, your host, founder of Vocal Impact Productions and author of Speaking to Influence, Mastering Your Leadership Voice. My guest today is Stan Silverman. Now, Stan is not only the founder of Silverman Leadership, but he was the former president and CEO of PQ Corporation, a global chemical and engineered glass materials company, and he's the vice chair of the board of trustees at Drexel University. Not only that, he's the author of the book, Be Different, The Key to Business and Career Success, and a nationally syndicated columnist in the Philadelphia Business Journal and 42 sister publications of the Business Journals of America. Stan, I don't know, A, how you have the energy to do all that when I'm exhausted just saying it, much less how you found the time to talk to, talk to us today. But thank you so much for doing that and joining me on the show today. Laura, thank you very much for inviting me to be here. Uh, it's my pleasure. Now, I've just given this whole litany of, of accolades, and I know I haven't scratched the surface because we've talked, I've seen your website, I've seen your LinkedIn page, and I, I, this is barely chapter one worth of all the things that you have done in your career and even are involved in today. Seems like you've done just about everything. So before we get into the actual uh, meat and potatoes of the interview, as it were, I have to ask, what's one thing you always wanted to do that you just have never gotten the chance to try? Personally, professionally, uh, I, or otherwise. Well, when I was 12 years of age, uh, I took piano lessons. And after a year, I gave them up to play baseball. And uh, I, I always regret that. And someday <laughs> I will go back when I have time and to relearn. So you're um, going to be a concert pianist, Carnegie Hall, or you just want to well, be able to play chopsticks? Pro probably not. I just want to be able to play for my <laughs> enjoyment. Um, but I, I will eventually do that. I will eventually do that. In it's all your free time. Okay, so we will look forward to having you come back and give us a concert recital, whether it's Chopsticks and Mary Had a Little Lamb or Chopin. Thank you. Playing the piano. Excellent. Now, when you think about your personal career journey, in particular, where you are now with these main roles, who do you need to influence? And how is that different from in other roles that you've had? Well, as CEO of my company, I was influencing everybody every day. It's like being a politician to a degree mm. where you have to um, align all the employees' uh, objectives uh, with those of the company, uh, create a sense of ownership in them, and so you can cut them loose and just have them do their thing, and they'll do great things if they have a sense of ownership. And, of course, you're always trying to influence the board in terms of what the, what the direction is you want to take the company. Today, my job is to influence everybody on how to be a better leader. And that's why I write uh, for the business journals. Um, I write on leadership, entrepreneurship, and corporate governance. That's why I wrote my book, because my, my place on earth today is to help everybody be successful. So I'm trying to influence them in terms of what I've learned so that they can use that to help themselves. It's, it's, it's amazing to think about the, the number of tentacles that go out there and how many people that you get to touch each day. Then in order to get to where you are, in, uh, whether it again was running the corporations, the larger corporations in your current role with your own company, uh, running the board, et cetera, what communication skills did you have to develop? What specific niche communication skills in order did you have to develop in order to have that kind of success? Well, it's a very good question because over the you're not really taught that, taught that in school unless you right. uh, major in communication. So you learn this as you go along and you find out that you make mistakes and then you get better at it. You have to be sincere with what you say. You have to have credibility. You have to have believability. Uh, people have to trust you. Without trust, nothing ever gets done. And so how you conduct yourself and how you communicate them will determine the degree of, of trust that you have with people. And if people trust you, uh, you, you'll be successful. Your organization will be successful. They'll all be successful. If they don't trust you, you might as well go and do something else. And so trust is just so very, very important. So how do you develop trust? You develop trust by basically not snowing anybody, by mm. telling them the, the truth by telling them what the facts are, by recognizing the brutal facts of reality, by listening to your experts. Uh, listening skills are just so very, very important in what we all do. And I went through a period of time with a former CEO where uh, he didn't listen to anything I said. Mm. And I started writing in memos 
and therefore he had to at least read what I had to say rather than listen. And he'd come into my office and say, well, that's a great, great idea, Stan, let's get it done. So that was when I was C chief operating officer. When I became CEO, I decided that we were going to change that paradigm mm. and that cultural norm. And so if one of my, if I were to say, I think we should go direction A on an issue, one of my direct reports might say, no, Stan, I think we should go direction B. How I respond to that individual will forever more set the tone uh, and dialogue between ourselves. So I would say, well, Bill, why do you think we should go direction B? And we would debate it for however long it took. We'd bring in experts if we had to. And not only would we decide whether we would go direction A or B, more than half the time we found direction C mm. better than A and B only because we debated it. And quite frankly, we hardly ever made a mistake when we, when we went through that process. So you have to be open to debating your, your, your people, your direct reports as equals. You may be screaming and yelling at each other, but that's part of the passion that you need to kind of get to the right place. And that, that helped us be very successful. And it's interesting that you mentioned that the, you almost never made mistakes when you did follow that particular process and really uh, play devil's advocate with each other and push back and, and poke right. all the possible holes. What is a mistake that you made at one point or a lesson you had to learn the hard way? If you could go back and do a do-over on that front, what would you do? And I, I, didn't listen, I, I didn't listen to an expert. <laughs> <laughs> Can you I give an example? So strong, I felt so strongly that we should do this. And of course, a leader has to make the final decision. You can't always listen to your experts, but you take a lot of expert advice in and you decide what to do. And uh, I didn't listen to my expert because I had a certain paradigm that I couldn't break. And, uh, and I made the mistake and we had to write off an investment that um, we should have never made. And so I've learned from that. Uh, and I'm gonna listen to my experts and just understand that, we should all understand we have paradigms that is very difficult. Can you explain so what that means to, to, what does that mean to you, that there was a paradigm you couldn't break? A paradigm is a way of thinking. Mm -hmm. It's a belief, it's, they're strongly held beliefs or their beliefs of, 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 of taking certain actions because you feel it's the right thing. And sometimes when those paradigms are held very, very strongly without the ability to break through, we tend not to listen. And sometimes that's just not the right thing to do. So I am much more open today mm. in listening to other people's opinions. Now, I may not follow their opinion, but I'm going to listen as much as I can and, you know, the leader, the buck stops at the leader's desk. So it's going to be your responsibility. But you've got to have the best input you can possibly have. The best input you can possibly have. And those, those paradigms can be hard to break through. You know, we, we, th we think we're open. We think we're interested in, in exploring. But we can be a little uh, stubborn sometimes in, in how we believe things need to be done. Is that? To Absolutely. We can be stubborn. And we have to guard against that. Because it's part of the, a human trait is to, for, you know, believe what you believe, but maybe there's a better way. Mm. So we have to think about that. We always have to think about that. It takes a little humility to, to be able to back down then and give somebody else the, the, the credit or the go ahead if it's something that's, that's not necessarily either our idea, perhaps, or even just the ability to shift when we've already stated a commitment of sorts to be willing to flex that can be hard to swallow sometimes in jim collins iconic book good to great yes. he talked about level five leaders yes and he went through all this data about companies that outperformed their peers by a huge amount then he went and studied the characteristics of the leadership of those companies and almost it correlated very very highly to leaders that were uh, humble that listened that were not imperial, did not trample over people, basically used their teams to the best of, of their ability, hired yeah. the very, 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 very best people. Uh, and he uses the simile that uh, you, you put the people on, the right people on the bus and they'll decide where to take the bus. And so those leaders are very, very successful. It's not the other type of leader. And so I've tried to model myself to that type of leadership. And I think I'm that way naturally. But not always. So, I mean, we don't, we, sometimes we make mistakes and we're not always perfect or what we think is perfect. And no, no, we probably shouldn't be either. Well, I, I, we stop growing. We stop growing as individuals. 
I, I think perfection is a scary word, right? Because it's such an unattainable status to reach. I think we're all, we'd like to think we're perfect. We'd like to think we're always right. Uh, striving to constantly improve, I think is terrific. And the, the uh, even to reference that book, Good to Great, which I do highly recommend to everybody. There are a lot of numbers, but the case studies are incredible. Notice that it's good to great, not good to perfect, right? Nobody's perfect. Actually, the, the first six words of his book are, good is the enemy of great. Mm. So you hear a lot of CEOs say, my company is great, we're great, we're great, we're great, we're great. You're not great. I would never, I would never want our people, and we did very well. In my five years as CEO, we took earnings from $14 million to $43 million. And people, after the second or third year, they're starting to say, well, aren't we great? I said, we're not great. We're good in this area. We're very good here, but we got a lot, a lot of ways to go in this other area. Because once people think that they're great, there's no place to go. Yeah. And you'll get eaten up by competition because the competitors are always after you. So if you think you're great, you're going to stop. Then you're going to get killed. Mm. And as Andy Griff said, only the paranoid survive. <laughs> you got to be paranoid about everything every single day because the competitors are trying to kill you. And you have to stay ahead. So I would always say, no, we're not great. And if, if third parties want to say we're great, they can say that. And our response is, well, we're on a journey to become great. We're always on a journey. We're always on a journey. Sure, sure. There's a vigilance, especially with regard to competition. And uh, it's easy to get complacent. And that's definitely some danger, dangerous territory. Right. So given all of this, then what's the next big goal for you professionally or personally for that matter? And what communication skills will you need to develop in order to reach it? Well, I want to get my book out to as many people uh, that will read it. Um, mm -hmm. The book is, uh, has gone overseas. Uh, I have a lot of followers on LinkedIn, 27,000 plus followers. Wow. And I get a lot of comments because uh, I, I post snippets of the book on LinkedIn sure. every couple of days. And my job right now is to get as many people as possible to read the book because I believe that will help them become better leaders. And I've gotten no negative comments at all about what's mm -hmm. in the book, only accolades. And so I was on the way of getting the book out to many college students across the country, but of course the pandemic has stopped that. Mm -hmm. So I think as soon as the pandemic eases and uh, we get vaccinated, I'm gonna start that again. And so my goal is to get this book in the hands of as many people as possible, because I think it'll help them become better leaders. Excellent, speaking circuit involved? Uh, oh, I've been on the speaking circuit, which stopped in March, actually. So I sure. went from live to Zoom. <laughs> so I'm kind <laughs> of Zoomed out, have. actually, like yes. many people are. Yes, you know, yes. Like many people are. Now, Stan, this brings us to the 24-hour influence challenge. So what would you like to give to our listeners as a direct challenge for them each to take individually one step that they can complete in the next 24 hours to have greater influence? I want them to think about how they're going to get out of their comfort zone and how they're going to help the people that report to them get out of their comfort zone. Think about that over the next 24 hours and then do it for yourself and do it for the people below you because there's nothing like you getting out of your comfort zone to develop and also for them to think about uh, it's okay to make a mistake. It's a, you'll never, people that never make a mistake never do anything. Mm. And so they should be tolerant of the people below them when they make a mistake. And of course, the response by their people would, normally is, well, you know, I don't want to really hurt the company. Well, you can de-risk your decisions. And so you're not going to hurt the company or your department. And so how do you de-risk your decisions? Even if you have all the responsibility, even if you have all the authority to make a decision, it's okay to ask people their opinion if you're a little unsure. People think that's a weakness when you ask people their opinion. That's a strength. That is a real strength. And so if they can change people's paradigms and get them to get out, get out of their comfort zone and start thinking about how they can take risks, but the risk, the risk of their decisions, I, I think it's going to be very, very positive for them and for their people reporting to them. 
So should we qualify as far as making those kinds of mistakes? We're not suggesting that, you know, if you're an accountant, then you can lower your standards and not worry about making some mistakes along those lines. That's, that's no. not what we're talking about here. No, no. There, uh, of course, you know, if you're running a nuclear power plant, you don't want to make, <laughs> you don't want to deviate, deviate from the protocols of running the power plant, right? So people, people know what I mean when I, when I say that. People I know what I mean when I say that. Sure. So just to, we're, we're looking at thinking outside the box, finding new opportunities for growth, for development, trying something new. Taking an assignment where you have no, no experience, but in your gut you feel, I can do this. Well, mm. volunteer for the assignment and do it. Get help if you need. But after you've done that assignment, uh, you're going to feel really good. And we could spend hours with every time I've gotten out of my uh, comfort zone in sure. my company. And it's what took me to the CEO ship. So I was constantly getting out of my comfort zone, constantly volunteering for things, but always, always asking for help if I didn't understand something. And people will give you help. Sure. All right, everybody. Stretch. Think about where your comfort zone is and how you're going to take a step out of it. This brings us to part two, which is about guiding others on the journey. Thinking about things like succession planning and career advancement in the company. When you think about terms like executive presence, otherwise known as leadership presence or command presence, how would you define it and, and how do you recognize it in others? Or gravitas Yes, is, is how I would, I would describe it. Um, <clears throat> it's the ability of an individual to capture the hearts and minds of the people that they're leading and to do that, I mean, it's, things are very, very simple. Number one, always have eye contact. Mm -hmm. Never, ever, ever lose eye contact. Always listen and ask questions for understanding. Don't ask questions to challenge the other people's position. Mm. Uh, that will turn them off. But if you ask questions for understanding, it brings them along and it shows that them that you are interested in what they're talking about. Whenever you make presentation, how many times have we, have we sat in a PowerPoint presentation given by an expert and we're in the second round where we can't read the slides? Mm -hmm. We can't read the slides. That has happened to me so many times by world experts in their area. Well, hey, put yourself in the audience and whenever you communicate, it's not for you. Yeah. It's for the person receiving the information. Put yourselves in their position and decide what is the best way I would like to hear what this individual is saying and tailor your presentation for the audience, not for yourself. You don't matter. Yeah. The person listening matters. Yes. And so as you build up these skills, you'll find that people will be more responsive to what you have to say and what you're selling. You're always selling your ideas. People think, well, I'm not a salesman. I'm not on a road selling, so I'm not selling. You are selling every single day. You're selling your ideas to your boss, to your peers, to your direct reports. And that will influence the direction in which the company goes, perhaps. So you're always selling. I could not agree more. This is something I've reiterated with everybody from students to clients to whoever else. We're all in sales. Ask my four-year-old. Every time he lobbies, it's all about the sell. Yes. Right. He the four year olds know all about that, don't they? <laughs> yes, yes. Somebody convinces us that we don't do it much later on, but we, we're born salesmen. Absolutely. And we have to use our abilities and develop our abilities to be successful. Yes. Take all that raw material and, and sharpen those skills as you go. Absolutely. Absolutely. Then when you're grooming a high potential employee or looking to hire somebody for an executive position, what are the three most important communication skills you look for in them? Um, I actually ask them, well, when they're, when they're talking to me in an interview, you're picking up all kinds of cues, right? Mm -hmm. so I'm looking for them to uh, talk about their past experiences and how they've been successful communicating an idea or a concept or a process to other individuals. Mm -hmm. I'm also looking for them to not take all the credit for the successful things they do, mm -hmm. but I'm looking for them to say, Boy, my team did a great job on this. We work together and, um, you know, one plus one plus one equals seven. And I'm looking for them to give accolades because if they don't give accolades, um, it, it just doesn't feel right. I'm also looking for them to use the word we and not I. I don't like to hear people say, I did this, I did this. Well, you know, they did it, but you know, we did this, we did that. They do it through teams, through the people they work with. And so you pick up, you pick up these cues. I also want to know, and you know, a lot of people are surprised at the first question I ask. I say, 
tell me about what tone at the top and corporate culture means to you. They look at me and say, well, what do you mean? Well, some people do. Well, tone at the top, of course, is the ethics and morals and morality that the CEO or the department head operates under. It's the ethics, which are extremely important to me. I will never, ever, ever work with somebody that's not ethical. I'll fire mm -hmm. them. I will not work with toxic individuals. I used to report to one. Mm -hmm. He nearly destroyed the, um, the department that he ran. I got promoted to be his uh, peer, then got promoted three years later to be his boss, and I fired him. I will never, ever tolerate a toxic person. And I sit on audit committees of all my boards just to hear what comes in on the hotline about toxic individuals. Because hmm. I want to know what the CEO is going to do about it. Yeah. And so you, you pick up cues about the kind of person that, you know, and that individual is and whether you want to hire them or not. Now, interestingly, that, that sort of leads halfway into my next question, which is the flip side of the coin with regard to a red flag that would be a career derailer, perhaps, or prevent you from hiring or promoting somebody. Talk to, talk to me a little bit more about that toxicity. What, what do you mean by a toxic person? A toxic, a toxic boy. I write about this a lot because I have personal experience. With it. Sure. In fact, I have to keep my voice, you know, even when I talk about it, because <laughs> even now, it, it gets to me, right? And so a toxic individual does not respect their direct reports, will micromanage everything, will force them to come to, the, to that uh, individual to make a decision which is so far down below that individual, there's no reason why they shouldn't even know about why those decisions are being made. Uh, does things in a gray area. Uh, you know, there's legal, there's gray area, and then there's, there's illegal things. Well, they don't care. They just do it because they want to get results to drive their bonuses up. Uh, we can talk about what happened at Wells Fargo a couple of years ago mm. when the vice president of community banking basically forced the people in the bank branches to create phony accounts to drive up her bonus numbers. And then when employees reported on the hotline to the bank, to the corporate, about what was going on. Six of them got fired, mm -hmm. acknowledged by Wells Fargo. They admitted that occurred. Well, where was the board? Where, where, where's the tone at the top of the CEO? I can't tolerate that. I will not tolerate that. Mm -hmm. And in fact, when I'm on boards, I'm very strong with my position. And, you know, I don't work for anybody anymore except for myself. And so I can take all my experiences and try to help people be better leaders be, and run better companies. And, uh, you know, be places where people want to work. Yes. Yes. People don't want to work there. It doesn't matter how much you're, that one person thinks they're producing. It's, it's the bottom's going to fall out. Right. I, eventually, especially today with social media, you know, you operate on the wrong side of ethics. It's going to come out. Yes. And then you're disgraced. Your company loses, well, Wells Fargo lost billions of dollars. Volkswagen, when they uh, cheated on the emissions uh, testing on their diesel cars, lost tens and tens of billions of dollars. The CEO is, is, is going to go to jail. Uh, Volkswagen, uh, uh, the general manager of Volkswagen U.S. is already in jail. Mm -hmm. I mean, these people think they're going to get away with this stuff. Plus, pe people should go home. Employees should go home and say, boy, this is a great place to work, instead of thinking, or the Fed's going to knock on my door tomorrow. I'm going to have to turn state's evidence against what our company's doing. Yeah, we hope that people don't come to that, down to that degree of fear on the, on the way home. That's a bad drive home. Yes, I know. I know. Then let's talk about managing up, finally, with regard to your direct reports. This is what I like to call the pet peeve question. When people have to present information up to you, your reports, what do you wish they would do differently? I wish they would have recognized the brutal facts of reality and just tell me like it is and tell me how they want to fix it. I don't want it to be sugarcoated because if they tell me, if they tell me their problems and they tell me how they're going to fix it, I'll probably say, okay, let's talk about it and you know, tell me what happens a month from now. It's like when I go into a board meeting. Um, if I try to push something across, th across to the board, which isn't true, they sniff it out and it's a two hour conversation. Mm. If I go into the board and say, we really screwed this up, but this is how we're fixing it. They say, okay, tell us the next board meeting how it's going. It's like a four minute conversation. People don't want to be surprised. People want the people reporting to them to be honest. They want to, they want to know that 
you understand the brutal facts of reality, and therefore you can fix the problem. If you don't understand the brutal facts of reality, you have no chance of fixing the problem, and it gets worse. So maybe the point where it becomes unfixable, mm. then you're in real trouble. So I want them to be just honest with me, and hey, this is we screwed this up, or this occurred. And of course, you always have to. You never say that without saying well, how you're going to how you're going to approach it. You right. always have to follow it with that, or else, well, you know, why did I hire you? You got a problem? You're not fixing it. So what are you going to do? It may be the wrong approach, but at least I want to know what they think they should be doing. At least you know they put some thought into it. And then we'll talk about. If I think it's there's a better way, we'll talk about it. But I want to know that they've thought about a way to fix it. You never say there's a problem without saying how you're going to approach the fix. Got it. Well, this brings us to the final part of our of our uh, interview, and this is the speed round. Now, in the speed round, these are three common themes and challenges that constantly are coming up in my coaching and training discussions with clients and at events. And a lot of people tend to think of them as black and white issues, either ors, which clearly they're not, but they also often feel like they're the only ones struggling in these areas. So I want people to understand that this is not the case. They're not alone. So first, I'm going to give you a, a very simple topic, and I'd like you to give a one or two word answer initially on where your gut is on some of these topics where you land. And then I'm going to prompt you with a follow-up question where you can give a bit of insight or advice uh, to follow up. So first, public speaking, love it or hate it. Well, I love it. And so for those who may or may not love it as much, can you give one tip for managing nerves or for speaking with confidence, even when you don't feel it, perhaps? Early in my career, I was fearful of speaking in public. Okay. I was absolutely, absolutely fearful. And I knew that I was going to be successful. I'd have to just plow through it. And I did. So the more, the more you speak, the more confident you are. And so you just have to do it. You just have to do it. The other thing I would suggest people do, which I didn't do early on, but it's, I think it's absolutely critical, is get some media training. You can get this in college and university. Um, and so that way you can see yourself on tape, on video, and you can critique yourself. It's absolutely critical that you, that you come off as being real and being honest and being forthright, believable and trustworthy. And you develop that by practicing it and seeing yourself doing it. Yes. In all of my training and coaching, the, the video camera is a, an essential tool. Nobody escapes. Even my graduate students, everybody has to use the video camera. And I liken it to your best friend who has no filter. They will tell you, meaning the video camera will tell you, oh, so directly. If you've got spinach in your teeth, it's going to tell you you've got spinach in your teeth. If it's not liking what you're doing with your hair, it's going to tell you that. And if it doesn't like what you said, it's going to tell you that too. So, But it'll also tell you when you did something great. So thank you very much for reinforcing that uh, encouragement to use the video absolutely next introvert or extrovert where do you oh, fall on that continuum i'm definitely an extrovert i like people i like talking to people i don't like the fact that i'm in my house now for three months only talking to people across the screen and i do probably four or five zoom calls a day i want to be across the table i want to be at lunch i want to be at breakfast i want to be at dinner with people i want to be able to read them and there's a huge limitation uh, doing it the way we're doing it now. And so I'm, I'm definitely an extrovert. There's no question about it. So what's one strength of being an extrovert then? And what's an area that you have to work on as a result of being it? Okay. A strength of being an extrovert is that you're able to engage people and you're able to make many times a connection where in the future you can help them or they can help you. And so one, time, one thing I tell all of our uh, college students that I, uh, at Drexel that I coach and counsel is you can't do enough networking, network, 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 because you never know where it's going to take you. And um, I did a lunch and learn a couple of years ago. And at the end, this young woman comes up to me and says, I would like to do, I'd like to get a job in San Francisco. Do you have any contacts for me in San Francisco that you can help me with? So I thought for three or four seconds, I said, send me an email on exactly what you want. She did, and I forwarded an email to Rochelle Parnham, who at the time was number three at eBay, chief marketing mm. officer, now a current trustee at Drexel. I had met her a year before that when I went out with the close school to visit all these entrepreneurs, Apple, eBay, PayPal, in San Francisco area, in Silicon Valley. 
So within three hours, this young lady is now connected with number three at eBay because she had the courage to ask me for help. If you don't ask, you don't get. The worst I could say is, I'm sorry, I can't help you. Well, today she has a really great position, mid-level management position at Google in Thailand. Oh. So she's going places. She's going places. And look at that, all from just taking the chance and asking a question. You have to network. You have to network. You have to know how to enter a room, know which group to break into, introduce yourself, break out after a couple of minutes, and go visit another group. That skill is only gained by doing it. You have to do it. Then what's an area for growth as a result of being an extrovert? Something you constantly have to work on. Uh, I, I have to work on um, knowing when to shut up. <laughs> <laughs> knowing when to keep quiet and have the other person speak. I'm much, much, much better at that now because I, I can control myself and I know. I know I should speak for you know, three or four or five sentences and then keep quiet. And so I've developed it over time, but... I still have a ways to go, I think. <laughs> Lastly, how about conflict? Nobody likes it. We understand that. But when faced with potential conflict or a difficult conversation, is your natural gravitation to want to avoid it or address it head on? Well, you have to address it. Um, and whether it's head on or not depends on the individual and the circumstance. But you're not going to resolve the conflict if you don't talk about it. And so you have to decide how you're going to approach the individual and talk about it. Or if you see two individuals are within your organization that conflict together, they're, they're, I don't usually bring them down, bring them into a room together and, and first and talk to them both together. I'll talk to them each individually so I kind of know where they are. And I can resolve it sometimes that way. And if I have to, I'll bring them together. But I always like the personal touch and that kind of said, that says that you should talk with these individuals one-on-one -on -one first. I'm, fairly, I'm very good at talking one-on-one -on -one, one with people. And then you get it resolved. What's or, you don't. or you don't. And then one of them has to leave, perhaps. Depends. Well, hopefully we don't get quite to that point, but that's the beauty of having the chance to talk to them both and understanding both sides. Then when you come exactly. to the table, you have a little clearer picture of... More than your, your, job, your job as boss is to do that. That's why you get paid the big bucks, is to, is to get that result. Fantastic. Um, so, Stan, then tell me, how can people learn more about you? Uh, I would love people to learn more about me. They can learn more about me from my book, Be Different, The Key to Business and Career Success. You can purchase it on either Barnes & Noble or Amazon. Um, or if you'd like, um, I've created a, a little bit of a teaser. Uh, the book has four uh, sections to it, four parts to it. Uh, the book is available uh, in part one only. And if you would send your email address to uh, contact at silvermanleadership.com, I will ensure that you get uh, that, first, that first part. And if you think it's interesting, you can order the book. So okay. I want to make sure that I'm catching it. It's at silvermanleadership.com where they can go uh, to, to learn more about the, the company in general. In your book, you're giving away that first of the four sections for yeah. free for people who want to see it. If they email, was it contact or info at? Uh, well, why don't we make it info at? Okay. Yeah, that's, I'm sorry. That, in fact, is what it is. It's info at silvermanleadership.com. And if you go on my website, silvermanleadership.com, uh, you can see all the articles that I've written for the Business Journal, over 300, over 300 articles for the Business Journal, plus dozens of articles and other publications. You can look at all my, listen to my podcasts. So it's, it's a, my, my website is a repository of everything I've done in this area, and you're more than welcome to look at it. SilvermanLeadership.com, please do so. So you'll get an MBA worth of information if you just stay on his website for the next well, the rest of your life, probably, because I have a feeling the information is going to keep coming and keep growing from there. Well, it keeps coming, and it's really an MBA plus. <laughs> it's what you learn after you get the MBA. <laughs> oh, it's okay. It's the what next you step. Learn after you get the MBA, yes. MBA 2.0. Stan, thank you so much for taking the time to join me today. It's been a pleasure speaking with you. Laura, thank you very much for having me on your show. It's been an absolute pleasure for me speaking with you and the audience. Thank you.
And to the audience, everybody else who's tuning in, thank you for joining us today. Be sure to subscribe so you never miss an episode and give us a five-star rating on iTunes so we can help even more people increase their confidence, presence, and influence. And finally, if you want to download my quick start guide to mastering the three C's, command the room, connect with the audience, and close the deal, go to speakingtoinfluence.com. I'm Dr. Laura Sokola, and you're listening to Speaking to Influence, communication secrets of the C-suite. Hi everyone, this is Dr. Laura Sokola, and I wanna sincerely thank you for listening to the Speaking to Influence podcast. If you love listening to these episodes as much as I love bringing them to you, be sure to subscribe so you never miss an episode. And please go to iTunes right now to rate and review our podcast in order to help us expand our reach so even more people can master the three C's to command the room, connect with the audience, and close the deal. Thanks for listening to Speaking to Influence, Communication Secrets of the C-Suite, the show for leaders who want to speak with impact. The hosts, producers, owners, and media distributors of the show make no guarantees that the strategies and information discussed will result in profit or other success and may result in losses. The opinions and statements of the hosts and guests do not necessarily reflect the opinions of the owners, staff, managers, broadcasters, or sponsors of the show. No medical or psychological therapy or personal or professional wellness or relationship advice is offered in the show. You are advised to seek counsel on matters related to your health, family, relationships, job, or other business and legal matters from licensed advisors in those areas prior to making any changes in business or lifestyle. No information provided may be suitable in your situation. As always, take responsibility for the decisions and actions you take, including the reactions they may make in your work, family, health, and life.